for the public, dry gold markets, they call Richard Stokes from the United Kingdom. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's very nice to see real human beings in a real live environment. So thank you all for attending this morning. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the tri-gold market. Um, so I'll start off just mentioning uh, the time charter rates we experienced from last year, 2021. So obviously there was quite a lot of uh, inventory restocking uh, after the COVID lockdowns and fragmentation to the various supply chains across the world that we saw. So just here you see on the top there, uh, four major sectors in the dry bulk. I'm sure you're all very familiar with those. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is everything cool? Yeah. So on the top left hand side, the dark blue is the Cape size vessels. These are very sensitive to the China trade because they're principally carrying iron oil and coking coal uh, into the Chinese steel industry. Uh, they tend to be between 150 and 200,000 dead weights. Uh, but then that, you see the light blue line is the Panamax. These are basically grain ships, 70 to 80,000 dead weight. And then moving across the grey, the Supermax uh, tend to be 40 uh, to 60,000 dead weight. And then finally the small work is the handy sizes are 20 to 30,000 dead weight. So if you look at that chart, clearly it's just a gradual uptrend. Uh, the Cape size vessels were the ones that enjoyed the the better returns you <coughs> see there on the left hand axis is, is US dollars per day, which is the rate that the cargo and understated ship owner transport his goods. And these cape size rates roaring away up to about $90,000 a day, uh, driven, as I say, pretty much by the China trade. So that all fed through into a strongly rising budget dry index, uh, BDI. It's basically an uh, index compilation for, for the key individual trade routes in the dry bulk market. Uh, and you can see it rising nearly sixfold, uh, just on 6,000 during the course of last year. So, a lot of this was real demand coming back, but a lot of it also was, as I mentioned, these fragmented supply chains, meaning a lot of ships got caught uh, in the roads waiting to berth in ports. The ports got very congested, uh, the inland interns couldn't, couldn't distribute the goods quick enough. So there was always this uh, issue about what was going to happen after some of these very high congestion levels started to come off. So this chart is a little bit busy, uh, but you can basically see, you see that little yellow dotted line, you see pre-COVID here, it's uh, uh, just flatlining at around 16, 17%. And then once we get here on all four sectors, you can see how it's, it's rising quite sharply uh, for, for all of these four quartiles. And particularly the Supermax is the dramatic one. We have over 20% of the fleets essentially tied up doing business, so net reduction to available tonnage uh, for future demand. So what happens? Well, unfortunately, uh, this is what happened. Uh, a complete return journey on the BDI from 6,000 mark down to around 1,000 mark. So this is just giving some background uh, in terms of correlations. You'll see here over a six-year period, uh, basically the BDI tends to cut high prices. Uh, they're on the right-hand side axis and dollars per tonne. You can see how they, they peaked up to about 250 before coming back to this trading range at 75 to 100 in correlation with the BDI on the left hand side. The BDI being the BDI as our country. Um, honing in on the same sort of correlation and relationship, this is representative of one of the prime routes uh, for the Iron Ore from Brazil into China. And again, with the PDI here in the red, you can see how it's tracking uh, essentially uh, freight rates for pink size uh, reserve China, which again just tries to illustrate the difference of, of China demand on pink size rates. So, just as we were suffering the decline in freight rates, unfortunately, we had uh, in February. Uh, Russia invading Ukraine, 
You'll see on the left-hand side here the Bloomberg Conti Stock Index. That's the peak pre GFC in 2008. And you can see it's already breaking out on a 20 year basis and then it's spiking up as a result of uh, everything that resulted after the 26th of February. Uh, we can see here the individual commodities, um, how basically over the ensuing three months uh, they spiked. You see coal, you know, recently a, a dirty word, a dirty cargo coming back in. 50% price rise, and then possibly more obviously, rent at 27%, and soft commodities at 28.5%. Um, so, here, this is representative of basically how dependent uh, the EU is on imports from Russia and Ukraine, second behind basically China. And here again, we see the import dependency on certain key commodities, coal, fertilizers, and steel around 35 to 40%. So this next slide is basically illustrating some of the change in trade patterns that occurred as a result of uh, various uh, import bans from, from Russia. So back, back to coal, as I was mentioning, you see here how uh, there's a huge spike in imports as a result of the energy crisis in Europe, and the soaring prices uh, for natural gas and how does that translate? Well, it translates into new sources. So formerly you had a, a short haul trade from Russia, from the Black Sea into Europe. Now you're having to go to South Africa to bring in these coal imports. South Africa very quickly from a very minimal and important five percent is jumping up to 35%. Um, so where does this leave us now? It leaves us basically uh, with these breaks just declining uh, on, on a gradual downtrend. Uh, we see the Cape size, which is the most volatile sector, um, coming back down to just five thousand dollars per day, uh, and basically reflective of China obviously being closed at the moment on the zero tolerance COVID policy. Basically, not really producing very much steel at all. Iron imports are down. We have a low property crisis at the current moment. Uh, and also, this coincided with a bit of greening due to the uh, Beijing Winter Olympics back in January, February. So, a little bit of recovery recently, but gradually downtrend overall. So where do we find ourselves now? Um, well, if Ukraine war persists, then we're going to see more commodity price volatility and changes in trading patterns. Uh, we had the Federal Reserve embarking on this really aggressive uh, monetary raising policy, because we've ever seen in financial history, uh, in combination with problems in Europe on the energy crisis and China, as I mentioned. So that's all causing a reduction in demand. More talk now about recession fears rather than just stagnation, which is what we thought we were looking at a few months ago. Uh, we all know about inflation rampant across the world, mainly from the supply side, and now we're even starting to see that the currency contagion, the, the collapse of the pound, back to one to one dollar, we know what's happening with the euro. So it's all causing a little bit of instability at the same time as we're seeing the EEI back below one thousand. And having shown you that nice chart of the positive price increases, that 35 40% has now come back down again to par uh, as these prices do retreat. This is just a, a chart to illustrate on the left hand side. Uh, this is basically, this is using the annual cycles uh, for, for the BDI. Uh, this way, one is 2021, I've seen a peak I showed you on the BDI before. Uh, this dark blue one is where we are so far in 2022 through to the uh, end of August. Uh, that's just a forecast. But what it's gradually uh, suggesting is that basically we've seen most of the action in Q2, Q2, Q3 is going to be neutral, and with these macro parameters, probably suggesting Q4 could be a bit, a bit bearish. So looking forward to 2023-2024, uh, actually it's not all negative. Uh, I've mentioned already that while uh, net demand may drop off, you, you get these, these longer 
steam cabins for the ships and to source their commodities for further afield. Uh, if we can get some of the dynamics on the supply side of things, think about labour and power outputs, um, a little bit of incremental demand at the margin is going to have quite a strong uh, positive impact. China, we the Congress next month, we, we were or anticipating some form of stimulus over the previous few months, and obviously with COVID that's not coming through, but I suspect it wouldn't be too far away. Um, so any easing of the current conditions we, we find ourselves facing now in terms of sanctions and tariffs, and obviously costs of the demand side. Um, and we also have basically uh, these new green shipping uh, regulations coming in, which is a big, big thing for shipping as an industry. Uh, the EDI, the Energy Efficiency Design Index, which is obviously to ship construction, and an operational metric carbon intensity indicator, basically all going to put pressure on the older ships, maybe even render them uh, economic, uh, given they're reducing their speeds, um, and I think they may be forced out of the particularly high bond prices. Um, so just to follow up uh, with the next three slides, more about the supply side, which historically has been uh, probably the biggest problem that shipping has had to face. In essence, from the top top level down, uh, dry bulk, seagull train, and fleet growth are pretty much in kilter. Uh, and on the order book, um, it is actually, as I'm showing you now, the lowest for about 17 years, which actually is quite encouraging. Um, so here we have on the left, uh, we have, you can see that we had uh, supply growth, uh, fleet growth of around 4%, coming back to about like 2%. Uh, forecast for 2023. On the demand side, obviously COVID related there, uh, injury stock and bounce back. <clears throat> and here, this is looking not too bad, although it has to be said with the IMF sort of uh, pairing back their growth forecasts in certain areas of the world, maybe those figures come back a bit. But overall, that is not a bad supply demand balance. Uh, this is just illustrating here, you have a new building deliveries of the dark blue, uh, the light blue is a demolition, these are the vessels that are forced out of the fleet and go for scrapping, and these are the red dots are where you have actually the net additions given in that data that was being made from that. Uh, so again, you take out here, it's at 2022 and 2023, you might go a little, little, little bit more, 2024, hysterically, sorry, historically, uh, that is not very much at all. And then this is my last slide. Uh, and I think this is really quite interesting, kind of summarizes where we are at the moment. So this is basically the drive up all the books of percentage of the fleet. So if you go back to 2010, it's basically saying that you have 64% of the fleet on order, i.e. of the 16 ships. That's a huge, huge number. And you can see basically uh, how these figures have come down over this decade to where we are now, and we're at this tiny figure of 7% of the fleet, which actually is sort of, you know, nine times less than that original figure. Uh, so in absolute terms, those are fairly stunning figures. In relative terms, coming to the headline of the slide, shipbuilding capacity overall has actually shrunk by 40% uh, from this uh, 15 million CGD compressed uh, those tonnage, which is the shipbuilding output measurement uh, to just 30 million, so again, 40%. So I would just conclude by saying demand is a little bit unsteady as we've seen, but on the supply side, it really looks quite encouraging. So if we can get beyond lockdown, we can get beyond uh, the sanctions and tariffs, as I mentioned, uh, maybe it's not really good. Uh, thank you for your attention. Por um container mais.